Now I'm on. I feel like almost um, the steward at the uh, the uh, wedding, John chapter two. Hearing that music this morning, just both groups. I, I have to tell you, you've done us all a solid disservice. You you saved the best wine for last. Oh my. Um, just amazing the talent of these children, and then uh, yes, those two voices. Um, I was almost going to say, hey, let them let them do a couple of songs. That was that was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And you know, um, there are some people who give too much emphasis to music, and then there are some people who don't give enough emphasis to music. You know that um, Martin Luther during the Reformation, actually believed that Europe was changed more by the hymns that were sung than even by his preaching. Because the people would hear and remember the truth of God's Word that was being sung to them. And I think that's true for all of us, isn't it? I mean, I have to work so long to just memorize one verse, but it seems like I can remember a song the minute that I hear it. And Ephesians and Colossians both tells us that music is didactic. That means the worship of God has a specific purpose that it's not only vertical, but it's horizontal. It is to teach Songs and hymns and spiritual songs. We admonish one another. We encourage one another. And so there's a way in which um, that, that, that music uh, is preaching. It's proclamation. It's bringing forth God's Word. And, and also that's a good word for a lot of the more modern music um, that sometimes, oftentimes, is not very theological. Theological? Well, it's theological, it's just not correct in its theology. Or, um, I have no problem with a lot of instruments, I guess, but sometimes there's so much noise, I can't even hear what's being said. And it defeats the purpose of, of communicating truth. Communicating truth. So, man, I really... Uh, if I ever come back here again, please have those people sing more. <laughs> Can you come next year? Yeah. If they'll sing more. <laughs> that, was, that was just beautiful. It, it encouraged me. Well, let's go back to Romans 12. Verse 1. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, just to uh, summarize what we've learned so far, we have the Apostle Paul urging us, exhorting us, even begging us, here we can see that the Apostle Paul was not just a theologian that uh, cared only about truth. He cared about people. And he was here, well here we can see his pastor's heart. He genuinely cares for these people in Rome. And he's begging them, urging them to do the right thing. And what is that right thing? To present their bodies a living and holy sacrifice to God. That the greatest thing that we can do, the most reasonable thing that we can do, is surrender our lives totally to Christ. Now, when Paul says present, it's a once kind of a, he's not saying do this over and over, but it's a once and for all decision. Now, we know that's true, but at the same time, we have to make decisions every day, every hour. We have to remember that decision that we made to lay down our lives for Him. And also I want you to know that, that none of us have accomplished this totally. None of us. But we should all be like the Apostle Paul who says, look, I forget what's behind. And I keep pressing on. I keep pressing on to want to lay down my life more. One of the things that I loved about being in the mountains of Peru 
Whenever you would meet a fellow brother hiking through the mountains, maybe we were going up to take Bible somewhere, and maybe a farmer who was a believer was coming down with some goods on his donkey or his mule. If you asked them, if you said, Como estas, hermano? How are you, brother? They would always say this, Avanzando, avanzando, which meant advancing, advancing. I'm advancing. That's where believers ought to be. You know, I can be with, um, and I know that you can say the same thing, I can be with immature believers who maybe are really struggling in a lot of areas of their life, but if they are struggling, and if they are advancing little by little, I feel right at home. I feel right. No judgment. It's the self satisfied carnal person that you have to say, look, I really, I really don't have a lot of fellowship with this kind of person. But even but the broken, trembling, struggling, advancing believer, oh, what a beautiful thing. And if it's a beautiful thing to the people of God, how much more beautiful is it to God? Because a broken, a contrite heart, he will not despise. You know, folks, Christianity is the only religion where we can admit that we are wrong without having to be afraid. As a matter of fact, it is a benefit. If a person will just look at the Word of God and say, I'm not there, man, that's the first step in getting there, isn't it? It's actually looking at this stuff and saying, yeah, I need to change. Well, he says, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Remember again, we're a culture that always talks about his heart. You know, I love Jesus in my heart. Even though nothing in my life conforms to Christ's will, you can't judge me because you can't look in my heart. Well, none of that is true. Uh, what is in your heart is going to be revealed through your mouth, the direction of your life, the things you do. So you see, he's telling us, look, let's not be romantic or poetic here. Let's be real. Offer your bodies. Offer your hands and your mind and your eyes and your lips and every part of you to God. Holistically, everything that we have belongs to God and is to be for his glory. And he says that he wants us to be a living sacrifice. He wants us to be zealous for good deeds. But he also wants us to realize that we cannot live for God apart from God's life in us. We need to be praying for constant, constantly praying for greater and greater manifestations of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, this is true. The moment you were converted, you received the Holy Spirit, you were indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and you are complete in Christ. And yet, as Spurgeon so often said, we have faith, don't we? We are saved, but we cry out for more faith, don't we? We have been given grace. We are Christians, but we cry out for more grace, don't we? We have been given the Holy Spirit, but should we not cry out for greater and greater manifestations of his, life, of his life in us? And when I mean greater and greater manifestations, I'm not talking about necessarily, you know, these extraordinary miracles. I'm talking about the extraordinary miracle of a changed life, mm -hmm. the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, I would trade all these things that people often want to see, all these miraculous walking on waters and, and um, speaking in tongues and visions and dreams and all the things that so many people desire, I'd trade all of that just to be, just to have the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all those things. I, I, that's my problem. If you want, go ahead. Be a miracle man. I just want to look like Jesus. And, and that's my biggest problem. It's my wife's biggest problem in relationship to me. It's, it's, it's my children's biggest problem is that their dad is not as filled with the Holy Spirit as he ought to be. And he's not bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit as he ought to be. And, and let me say something else just really quick. You know, we've talked a little bit about family. You know, you can put all kinds of rules on your family, and it's just going to lead to death. But a father and a mother filled with the Holy Spirit, now there's something that provides fertile ground for the growth of children. 
a legalistic, mean-spirited, angry home is not going to produce anything. But the filling of the Holy Spirit, joy. Well, so we're to offer our lives as a living sacrifice and as a holy sacrifice. My dear friend, listen to me. The Word of God is just this beautiful revelation. And you cannot say that it's specifically about this certain thing or it's specifically about this certain thing. It's about so many things. But there is one thing that I can say, just one of the small things about the Word of God, is this. It teaches us to think as God thinks. And that means it teaches us to love what God loves. And it also teaches us to hate what God hates. Really. Truly. You know, there are some things that that we should hate. Now, I said things. I didn't say people. There are some things that we should hate. Those things that defile us. You know, I was listening to some stories yesterday from people here. You know, things that they were doing to try to help other broken people. And I just kind of walked back to my trailer and, and, and I, was, I was really angry. And I was angry at sin. Do you realize every problem in this world is attributed to sin? To people doing the things that God hates? The little children that are just destroyed in their minds and their hearts because of sin. The things that go on in this world, all of it is attributed to sin. And so God, God tells us that He hates sin. And He hates sin because it destroys the very things that He's made. And we, should, we should hate it. I was teaching in a university a few years ago in Europe. And I was talking about the law of God. And, and I, I brought up the fact that, that a lot of you are probably thinking, this is what I told the students, a lot of you are probably thinking, you don't want to hear anything about the law of God because it's so oppressive and restricting and restraining and it takes away your freedom. You know, we've all heard that, haven't we? And I said, would you just think for a moment about what you're saying? You don't want God's law because it keeps you from doing the things you want to do. Well, okay then, let's look at the law of God and find out why does it make you so mad. Okay, let's look at one of them. Uh, Love your neighbor as yourself. You hate that law because it won't let you do what you want to do to your neighbor? Uh, Don't lie. You hate, that's oppressive to you? That means you must love lying that much? Don't take your neighbor's wife. That makes you mad and you consider that oppressive? And I just went down through a whole list of things. Don't murder. And I said, so this is the law you hate? What kind of people are you? As a matter of fact, I want to leave this building right now. I'm afraid. Do you see the point? God's law is good. And if we hate it, it must say something about us. We're not good. One person said, well, yeah, but God, you know, everything for him. Well, the only option other than that is everything for you. That doesn't make much sense, does it? Doesn't it make more sense that all worship and honor and glory should go to the one who made the entire world? But the only other option, it goes to you. So you're lifting yourself above God when in fact you don't even know your next breath. So we ought to be a holy people. And it doesn't mean just rejecting sin. Rejecting that which is wrong. But it also means clinging unto God. Having a passion for God. Loving God. Seeing God as supreme. Now, here's, here's a good question. Well, it's a good statement to make. Preachers are real famous for telling people what to do, but not telling them how to do it. So if I sit there and I say, you need to love God more. And you need to see God as supreme. And you're sitting there going, yeah, I know that. And you telling me that just makes me feel worse than I already feel. But now here's the million dollar question. How do I do that? 
That's like telling a man to lift himself up by his own bootstraps. It's, you know, it's impossible. So if I tell you, you ought to love God more, and I tell me I ought to love God more, the next question is, well, how do I increase my love for God? You tell me I ought to see God as supreme, how do I increase my opinion of God? That's a good question, isn't it? Well, here's the answer. Um, I love my wife now more than I did when we were married. I mean, now I look back on, on my love for her when we were married and I see that it was, it was pretty superficial compared to what it is now. Now, why do I love her more? It's because I know more about her. And I've experienced more time with her. Now, here's what you need to see, and I need to be careful here because I don't want my wife to run up here and beat me up while you guys are watching. <laughs> I can say that about my wife even though she's not perfect. Okay? Over the years I have known her, I love her more because I have seen more virtue. I've also seen more flaws, but I've seen more virtue, and therefore I love her more. Now think about God. He is perfect. If your heart has been renewed by the Holy Spirit and you truly are a Christian, then the more you see of God's virtue, the more you will love Him. And that is why it's so important to teach on the attributes of God. Literally, if I started a seminary, which isn't going to happen, but if I ever started a seminary, and let's say it was a three-year seminary or six semesters, Every semester, the student would have to take two classes. Now, there'd be other classes, but every semester there would be two classes. One would be on the attributes of God, and the other would be on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they would study that all three years. And then they would be told that you have just begun to study the attributes of God. You don't even know anything. You have just begun to study the gospel. So you need to know more about God. More about God. How do you do that? Through His Word. Through prayer. And through reading men and women who really knew God. Knew the attributes of God. Tozer has a wonderful little book on the attributes of God. Pink has a wonderful book on the attributes of God. And there are others, it's so many others. And it's, it's very important. Now, so we need to be holy. We need to be a people whose heart is knit to God. Now we go on, and he says, an acceptable sacrifice. Whom do you hope to please? If you seek to please anyone above God that is idolatry, even children need to be taught that their obedience to their parents should not primarily be, the motivation for that should not be primarily to please their parents. It should be primarily to please God. You see, even someone who, who serves God because God can fix their family, that's idolatry. We serve God because God is worthy, period. Whether He fixes our family or not. Whether He heals us or not. Whether He does anything for us. Our primary goal ought to be to please God. Now, in order to please God, you have to know what God wants. And in order to know what God wants, you have to study His Word. I know, I know people who sincerely, sincerely are Christians. And they sincerely have a passion for wanting to please God. But they will oftentimes do the very things that God most dislikes. And it's not because they necessarily have a rebellious heart as it is, as the Bible says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. They just assume that this is okay with God, but they have not checked it out. Now, we want to be pleasing to God. Now look at this. He talks about us making ourselves a sacrifice, offering ourselves as a sacrifice, and then he says, 
which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, when we talk about worship, and um, last night I believe Brother Brother Deutscher was discussing this with me, talking about gospel worship from Burroughs. Um, we always think of singing. And, and singing most certainly is a beautiful form of worship. But that's just one tiny aspect of worship. Worship is when you lay down your life. That's worship. Worship is service. Worship is obedience. Every moment of your life should be worship. Doing the will of God is worship. And look what he says. He says, presenting your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable God, is your spiritual service of worship. You want to provide, you want to give spiritual worship to God? I believe what we heard today was spiritual worship. There seemed to be a beauty about it. There was a beauty about it. It was, it was real worship. But even that kind of worship in a life that is not laid down is not worship. See, laying down our life, giving ourselves. It's like, it, it, like look at it this way. Sometimes we think, you know, a man will think, well, I love my wife because I give her flowers the first day of every month. But he may also beat her, mistreat her, talk bad about her. Those flowers mean nothing. His I love you's on all those cards, they're, they're worthless. It's the same way. We can do acts of worship, but if we have not laid down our life, if we are not laying down our life, and we are not struggling and seeking to be more and more conformed to the will of God, then we're really not worshiping. You see? Remember what Jesus said? These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now, the most perfect thing is let's honor Him with our lips and let's have our heart close to Him. And now, this, this term here, our spiritual service of worship, the most spiritual thing you can do is lay down your life. But the word also can be translated rational. It's the most rational thing that you can do. You know what's irrational? This is what's irrational. To say... That I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. That He is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to the Father through Him. That every moment not lived for Him is a wasted moment. I believe all that. But I'm going to live in a way that contradicts it. Now that is irrational. That's like when I go to the, the person who calls himself an agnostic. And I say... You're not an agnostic. He goes, what do you mean I'm not an agnostic? I said, well, do you, if you are an agnostic, you're extremely irrational. And he says, well, why? I said, listen, the idea of God, the existence of God, is the most important truth that there is. If there is a possibility, even the most remote possibility, that there is a God, it is the most important truth for a man to discover. And you, saying that you're an agnostic, you are at least acknowledging there is a possibility that there is a God, and yet, that being the most important truth, you don't seek it out. You're nonchalant about it. That's insane. That's like screaming out of houses on fire and saying in house. You see... The most rational, the most irrational thing that you can do, or at least one of them, is to lay down your life to follow a man. I mean, that's insane. That's what a cult is. But the most rational thing you can do is to lay down your life to follow Christ. It's the most rational. What's irrational is to make a claim to Christ and then seek all of these different things in the world. It's just totally irrational. Or to do things that contradict the will of God. Now, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. 
what does it mean, this world? The word can also be translated, this age. Paul refers to it in other places as this present age, or this present evil age. The world refers to basically, not, not to the grass and the trees and the wilderness and the oceans and things like that that are so beautiful. The world refers to every idea, every act, every concept, um, every motivation, every influence, every affection, everything that contradicts the will of God. And we look at, at our world, we look at our age, and, and that's what we see, don't we? You turn on the nightly news, or you watch anything on television, or you just you know, go to the universities and all these different places, what do you see? You just see an entire world running the opposite direction of God. Fighting against God. Making decisions totally contrary to the will of God. And eventually decisions that lead to absolute absurdities. And what he's saying is don't be conformed to that. You see, Paul is recognizing here how powerful the world's influence is. And why is it so powerful? It's, it's very difficult for a person to swim up against the current. It's very difficult when the entire, almost entire mass of humanity is going in one direction and encouraging one another in that direction, applauding one another in that direction, and for you to turn and walk the other way, not only is difficult, but it causes those people to be angry with you. And even people in the church to judge you. And to not like you, and to say terrible things about you. And to eventually, and it will probably come a time in Canada and the United States, to lock you up. Mm -hmm. To persecute you. To take away your children. You see? This world has a great and powerful influence. Another way in which the world really gets in on us is through the eyes. Look over for a moment. Hold your place in Romans and go to 1 John. Chapter 2, verse 16. For all that is in the world. Now look, look at the way this is set out for us. The lust of the flesh. Now, the word lust here, what is translated as lust, it's a proper translation, but the word can mean just desire. And desire is not necessarily bad. For example, a desire for food, that's not bad. But an extreme desire of food, taking food as pleasure, becoming a glutton, that's sin. So, so what it, it's talking about here, it's just everything that has to deal with the flesh. And there are some things that, that we desire as human beings that aren't bad, but when they take the place of God, become more important than God, then they become a wicked, horrible thing. I mean, even the, even the study of, of uh, even ministry can become something of a lust of the flesh. Now, I know young men that start studying a little bit of theology and they, boy, they just start devouring it because they can use what they know to devour other students. You know, so even good things can become bad, but there's this, this lust of the flesh is so powerful. Do you know that I've been told that there is more uh, chemical things going on in a person who looks at pornography than a person who is on even things like cocaine? Mm. Mm. These powerful things that can grab a hold of you. Okay? And the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. What we see with our eyes, especially men, is so extremely dangerous. So extremely dangerous. That's why we're supposed to guard our heart. We're to guard our eyes. You know, I don't go to malls. I'm back home or whatever. If, if you know, 
every once in a while I have to go someplace to find something. But basically, I'm not going to go to a mall. And I'm not going to take my children, my boys especially, to a mall. Because what was 25 years ago, what was considered pornographic is now put in their windows. See, I know, no, that there are certain things you just don't go to. You just don't go there. You just don't do that kind of thing. Why? Because I don't want I don't want to deal with it. I got enough to deal with instead of putting myself in the middle of it. You say people say, well you can't you can't just hide from everything. No. But I don't have to pump it into my home. You see? It's the lust of the eyes and, and the boastful pride of life. Oh that we, you know, we just want to appear as something great in the eyes of other people. And as I've said, the eyes of other people that we don't even necessarily like. No, we want the biggest and the best and the flashiest and the shiniest and the, the homes and this and that and everything else. And it's just not right. It, it's not right. And it does not satisfy. It ultimately does not make you happy. Remember when I was coming here with my family... Uh, I, I watched this couple that were sitting right across from us in the airport, and uh, you could tell they were they were probably my age, man and a woman. I mean, he had a perfect haircut. Uh, he everything he had on and his clothes were in style. It was all just a super you know brand or something that people wear. The lady. Her, her clothes probably cost more than my car. And she had, you know, she had her hair doing perfect makeup and even their travel stuff. I mean, it was designer travel stuff and they all had their Kindles out and they were just, man, they were cool. And I could just, but I'd look at the expressions on their face. I saw almost no joy and, and hard looks and you see, they, they, they had what everybody's seeking for. And they weren't happy. You could see they weren't happy. I mean, everything was so intricate for them. They had to have the best of the best, the finest of the finest. And when that went out of style, they had to make sure to send that to Goodwill and go buy something else. It, it's just, it, it's horrid. Well, he says, look, don't be conformed. Let's go back to Romans. He says, don't be conformed to this. And the word conformed here means don't be pressed in the same mold. Now, here's how people get pressed into the same mold. Let's start from the very beginning with children. Children follow children. I don't know if you've noticed that. If you haven't, then, well, you need to. A child is born. And nowadays, maybe after six weeks or six months or something, mom goes back to work and the child goes to preschool. Or this nursery. And that child was raised by another woman who may not have any of the Christian virtues that the mom declares to have. But here's what becomes more amazing. The teacher doesn't even become the primary influence in that child's life. The other kids do. And that's why when he gets old enough, when he comes home at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock or whenever it is, his great desire the whole time he's in home at home is to get out of home and get back with his friends. Mm -hmm. And then you send them off to public school. And this is even increases now. Mm -hmm. They want to be with their friends. They want to play sports with their friends. They want to go out in the yard with their friends. They want to go their friends. And family becomes a burden. Their little brother. They no more want him around than a man on the moon. They want to be with their friends. They don't want to be with mom and dad at 5 o'clock to eat supper. And what happens is Eventually, the home turns into just a condo with individuals living in it and they all have their separate rooms. And the kid comes home and goes to his separate room. And the family is obliterated. But here's what happens. The primary influence on that child's life, what is shaping that child, is not his father. 
It's not his mother. It's not even his teachers. That'll, that'll begin sometime around the university. But it's the other kids. Other kids who, when they were nine, were exposed, or eight, were exposed to their father's pornography. And so your child is going to learn about sex, not from you, but in a filthy, dirty, secret way from some other child. And then this child is going to be there eight hours a day at least, five days a week, being taught by teachers who are secular in their mind, being taught by kids who are not only secular, but very perverted. And you know this is true. Young men, gentlemen, who went to public school, like me, where did you learn all your filth? From your home? And then, the father's not going to disciple. The mother's not going to disciple. The father will yell a lot when the kid doesn't turn out like the father wanted. Father may take any fishing down. And, of course, he'll go paint pictures of Noah's Ark every Sunday. So, all that, it's all the training he gets. And then you wonder why is this child conform to the age. And then, throw in television. Average is what? In North America now, three hours a day. Even the cartoons are grotesque. SpongeBob is an abomination. And so, what's happening? We are doing the exact opposite of what God told us to do. But then we come together and pray for a revival. Yeah. So, so this goes on. Then the kid goes to the university. Where universities have basically, even when I was in the university 150 years ago, <laughs> it, was a, it was a meat market. It was a moral meat market. And in the last 25 years, it is, it is degraded so much more, it's unbelievable. It is a Sodom and Gomorrah. And the professors, you have a secular worldview, there is no God, there is no right and wrong, and your child does that. Then he comes out and gets a job, and as most of you men who work know what a struggle you have in your jobs, because you're not like these preachers like me, just always kind of protected. You're out there working with people who curse and swear and tell vile jokes and everything else. And even as a grown man who wants to follow Christ and is reading the Word, you know how difficult it is to resist it and you know that you've been influenced by it. And yet the child gets thrown into that. So we have actually effectively lost. We have done everything that God told us not to do. Television, internet, everything in the home, and bam, look what you've got. You have not only allowed someone to come in, you've allowed them to come in with the mold, and you've helped them to press it down upon your children. And it's just one generation after another. You see, it's just true. I can't say anything else. I don't know what to do for you. I know that it's a battle in my own home, but I'm telling you, this is it's not a mystery. Remember I talked about the guy with the bloody forehead? I'm not a doctor, but there it is. And to change things, it's going to require a radical, radical, Rats change. In you. In you. Don't be conformed to this world. You know, even uh, our media guy, John Green, he called me in the office, in his office one day, and he goes, Paul, I want you to see this. And it was a trailer, you know, a movie trailer for Spider Man, I don't know, one, two, three, or something, something like that. He said, just look at this. It was 45 seconds. Now, I looked at it. There was nothing immoral at all about, you know, Spider-Man jumping from one place to another. But here was the thing that, that he was pointing out to me. After 45 seconds of watching that trailer, I was literally out of breath. 
I mean, that thing, that guy was jumping all over the place. Music was bombarding me. It was so exciting. I mean, it was. It was exciting. It was visual. It was powerful. It was, wow. Where can I get one of those suits? <laughs> I mean, it was, it was amazing. Now, here's the problem. A child is raised in that. And he can no longer walk through a forest and see any beauty. He can no longer be excited by a sunset. You take a video game. A little child is playing. And, and a guy is shooting people. I mean, I've seen these things. When I've walked like, through, a, through Walmart, they have them sometimes. A different place. And I mean, shooting people. I mean, guys are getting hit in the chest. Blood is going everywhere. The little kid thinks it's fun. I scored more points. And then one day he picks up a gun and he pulls the trigger. But the moment that chest explodes, if he finds out something, it's not like the game. That's why I go around and I talk about these things. I talk to young people. I say, young people, you know that game where you pull the trigger and you shoot all these guys? But yeah, I go, I have been there. I have grabbed a man off the floor with his chest blown out through his back taking towels and jamming it in the hole while blood is covering my body, trying to keep him alive. Passing out, gripping a hold of him so that the, 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 the policemen have to literally grab my arms and hit them because I'm totally locked in on this guy and can't move. I said, I know what it's like and I still want to throw up every time I think about it. You see, but we conform our children to this age and they don't see that. They become desensitized. You know, isn't it? Wouldn't it be neat, girls, if you did reach for a book like I was talking yesterday, and a boy reached for the book at the same time, and he touched your hand and he caused you to lose your breath? Wouldn't it be wonderful to feel something like that? You can't when you allow the world in and it desensitizes you. You can't read poetry anymore. You can't think of beauty. You can't think of purity. And you can't think of love without soiling it. We're not supposed to be a dirty people. We're supposed to be an innocent people. One time when, when my son, he probably doesn't even remember, he was so little. A man, I was walking through a church and a man said to him, Wow, you're a, you're a big boy. And you're a fine looking boy. I bet you've got a lot of girlfriends. I said, sir, step aside. I said, don't you ever talk to my son like that again. Do you understand me? So I don't know what the problem is. I'm going to tell you what the problem is. My little boy is supposed to be thinking about tree houses and slaying dragons and hunting for birds with his broken BB gun. And I will not stand here while he is soiled by someone as foolish as you. The Bible tells me to protect his innocence. Do not allow love to be awakened too early. He said, man, you can be kind of mean. Look, it's, it's time that some men got some backbone back. Yeah. It really is. I'm, just, I'm tired of all these tame, domesticated males. <laughs> Goodness gracious, there's something to fight for. And at times there's something to be angry about and sin not. And the protection of our children is one of them. <coughs> there ought to be a sense in which you're like a pit bull <coughs> with rabies. <laughs> <laughs> Do not be conformed to this world. Men, one of our responsibilities is to keep ourselves pure so we can keep our families pure. One of our responsibilities, men, 
is to stand at the door and tell the world, no, you're not coming in. I may not whip you in a fight, but I can tell you this. They're going to be carrying both of us off in an ambulance. <laughs> You've got to stand your ground on this matter. Now, goes on. Do not be conformed to this world. But, but, this is just a big, this term now. It's just coming in here and goes, I'm going to show you the complete opposite now. He says, but, but. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This word transformed in Greek is the word from which we get metamorphosis. You see, the world tries to put this mechanical mold upon you. But God says, I want to transform you, metamorphosize you, to make you into something beautiful, to change you. It's spiritual, it's life, it's power, it's not mechanical. Be transformed. Okay, every one of us wants to be transformed. We do. It's our longing. And most of us, like myself, if we have any sadness, if we are sad because we are not as transformed as we would hope to be. I look at my life, I'm going to be 50 in a few months. And I look back and I think, I'm just I just thought I would have made more progress by now. Yeah. And it hurts. But that's one of the signs that you're a Christian. That you mourn a bit. That you hunger and thirst for righteousness. You see. Love to tell the story. I was walking to the office of T.W. Hunt. He's, a, he's probably in his 90s now. He... Uh, was known and is known as the man of prayer. He teaches on prayer. He would pray for his students three hours a day. Very, very godly. And I walked into his office one day as a seminary student and I'm just like, just depressed. And I walk in his office and, and uh, Dr. Hunt looks at me and he just went, Paul, sit down. What's wrong? And I said, Dr. Hunt, I'm just not holy. I just don't know the Word. I'm just this and I'm not this. And I want to be more like Christ. And I'm just miserable. He just looked at me. And he goes... And he stands up and walks over and puts both his hands on my shoulders. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pronounce you blessed. And he went and sat down. And I was like... Kind of like a deer looking in the headlights type look, you know. And he goes, Paul, you don't understand what I just did. And I said, no, Dr. Hunt, I do not understand. <laughs> and he said, have you ever read, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. He said, Paul, if you came in here totally content, I would fear for your soul that you were even converted. But here you are. Hungering and thirsting and miserable for a lack of righteousness. Paul, that's the very sign that you are blessed of God. Mm -hmm. Brothers, I know that, that you're sitting there and you've heard some of the things I've said. And your heart is broken. You're thinking, man. But please understand, I say these things not because they hurt you, but because it's what you need to hear. But I also say these things because it's what I need to hear. See, there's no difference between us. This is true. I think I preach on it so much, not because I think there's a whole bunch of men out there that need to hear it. I preach on it so much because I need to hear it. One of the things that I always have realized that wise men taught me is Paul preached to yourself. <clears throat> Don't let yourself preach to you, mm -hmm. but preach the Word of God to yourself. Mm -hmm. And brothers, we need this. I need this. You need these rebukes. I need these rebukes. I mean, I'm sorry, we do. But boy, I would be in danger without them. 